The book of Acts tells the story of the beginning of the New Testament church. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he established what the church is to be, his people. He left us the guarantee of his Holy Spirit to continue his work through us. Thus began the never-ending story of nobodies. Hello everyone, the weather's being difficult, but that doesn't take away our opportunity to learn from God's Word, so that's what we're going to do. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to go grab it and turn with me, Acts chapter 2. We're starting a new series tonight, and I truly expect God will teach us big things if we come ready to learn from His Word. Um, this is going to be through one of my most favorite books in the entire Bible called Acts, and Acts is kind of like a sequel to the book of Luke. Um, Luke is kind of about Jesus his life and his ministry. And Acts is a continuation of that. It's once Jesus ascends into heaven, but his ministry continues. And it continues through his people, through the church. And this is why I love it. It's written by Luke. And I really like the way that Luke writes. He was a doctor, meaning he was, uh, he was meticulous. He paid great attention to detail, but also like a doctor, he was very good at telling a whole lot of complicated and complex information um, in a compact and easy easy to understand way. And I love that. That's kind of how this entire book is written. Um, a doctor, like say I fell and hurt myself, a doctor could say that Shane has a slight separation between the radius and ulna and a hairline fracture on his humerus. He should be out four to six weeks. Or the doctor could just say, Shane has a broken arm. Um, that's, that's how this book is written. This is basically what Luke does because um, while the whole book is 28 chapters long and there's a lot of complex details and stuff that we can look into, the entire story is intentionally summed up and consolidated into two verses very early on in the first chapter of the book. Acts chapter 1 verses 7 through 8. He, Jesus, said to his followers, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and all of Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's two parts to this. Jesus is saying, you're not going to know how I'm going to do what I'm going to do or who I'm going to use to do what it can and literally will be anyone. That's for me to know and you to find out. And the second thing he tells us is that everything will begin once you receive the power of my Holy Spirit to spread my name to the rest of the earth. And these two verses tell us the entire story of the book of Acts because that's exactly what happens. And then early on in chapter 2 of Acts, um, it says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the story continues from there exactly as Jesus said that it would. So after they're filled with the Holy Spirit, um, look at these verses in Acts chapter 1. What does it say for us to do once we receive the power of the Holy Spirit? It tells us to be the witnesses of Jesus. And what does that mean to be his witnesses? It means to tell people about him, to testify about him, to share the gospel. And we start off right in chapter 2, right after they get the Holy Spirit, with Peter. He gets right to doing that. And if you haven't turned with me, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. And if you're a note taker or you like following along that way, the title of tonight's message is going to be Nobodies. And we're reading a good chunk. We're going to hop around a little bit. But starting in verse 14 um, in Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven, is, announced, is lifting his voice to a, a multitude of people. And he addressed them and he said, men of all Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Basically, yo, listen up. For these people and myself are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. Like, yo, it is important to me that you know that we are not drunk. It's important to me that you know that we are speaking of a stable mind because what I'm about to share with you is the most important thing that you could ever hear. And then in verse 16, it says he starts quoting the Bible and in verse 17 he does so. He quotes the prophet Joel and uh, it says, in the last days it shall be God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And then it continues into verse 20, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the mud to and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Basically, what he's spelling out here is when each person is brought to judgment before God, it won't be fun. 
but for those who call on the name of Jesus to be their stand-in, they'll be saved. And here's the thing, though. Uh, God sent Jesus to save you, but Peter is saying, but you killed him. But then he continues, luckily, in verse 22 and 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. He did all these incredible things that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God knew this was going to happen. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. So the only means of being saved from your sin, Peter was telling them, you rejected and murdered him. It's a pretty hopeless situation for, for them, but Praise God for the truth of verse 24. Praise God that he doesn't stop. It continues. Verse 24 says, um, God, though, looked at Jesus and raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, bringing him back to life, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was not possible for death to hold Jesus down. God is so loving and merciful that he brought your means of being saved back to life so that every person could be saved. God made this truth known to King David a long time ago, and David wrote in Psalm chapter 16, which again is quoted by Peter here. He says in verses 25 through, uh, 20, through 28, it says, uh, I saw the Lord, this is King David saying, I, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope. I'm rejoicing. I'm glad I have hope. Why? Because you did not abandon my soul to Hades, to hell, or let the Holy One see corruption. You didn't compromise injustice either. You have made known to me the paths of life. You have made me full of gladness with your presence. God made a way for us, that we don't deserve it, that we act like we hate him. God made a way for every single person. He has made his work of salvation not only available to us, but apparent to us. And that's what uh, verses 32 and 33 tell us. Uh, Peter continues to preach and it says, this Jesus that God raised up and of, of that we are all witnesses. We saw that Jesus was raised up, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received him from the Father's promises of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. He, 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 no. Jesus is made Lord in Christ. This, this Jesus, this Savior that you crucified. Peter is saying everybody needs to know this. Listen up. Uh, we're all sinners. We, we all equally deserve eternal separation from God. My sin and your sin put Jesus on the cross. You didn't have to be there. You didn't have to be a Roman soldier. You didn't have to be in the crowd. But my sin put Jesus on the cross. And my sin is the reason Jesus was put on the cross. And the reason his death on the cross was needed. Because an eternal sin towards an eternal God requires an eternal sacrifice. And that sacrifice can only be made through the Son of God. But God, which is two of the greatest words that we can ever hear, is so good. And he is so rich in his mercy and love that Jesus could not stay dead. No, he, he rose back to life, defeating death, defeating sin forever. And this defeat of sin and death means a victory for Jesus and all who are with him. And it means we are offered the greatest gift of all time, a restored relationship with God for the rest of eternity. How dope is that? And I... The, the last few verses of this are incredible. And they're some of the most powerful scripture I've ever read. Um, let it be as powerful as it actually is when I read this. Um, listen, verses 37 through 41. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what do we do? I imagine Peter was so caught off guard here. He was like, I just preach repentance. I just preach that what you're doing is wrong and you need to turn around from what you're currently doing. They're probably going to hate me. But they're like, you're right. 
we are responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. What do we do? <laughs> and Peter is like, yo, God's, God's goodness really does lead to repentance. And he continues in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent, turn, turn around from your current life and turn to Jesus. But not only that, be baptized, every single one of you, because your salvation is not only for yourself, but your salvation is for you, for you to be a beacon of light to other people to see how powerful Jesus is to move and save through anybody's life. And baptism is a picture of that. So go be baptized so all of your loved ones can see this conversion that took place in your life. And you can be a living witness of that. And he continues, um, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is, is for you, yes, but also you're setting an example for your children and for all those who are far off, people that you're not even thinking about. For the Lord our God, for all who the Lord our God calls to himself. And verse 40 says, uh, Peter said a bunch of other stuff and continued to preach and he said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Verse 41 so those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls from one sermon. Peter did something so simple. Yet the Holy Spirit did something history-altering and life-changing. Peter just shared the gospel. He said in verse 21, like, nobody is saved by default. And then verse 37, he said, because of this, I need to be saved, and, and you need to be saved too. In verse 38, he said, uh, I repented. I committed myself to Christ. You need to do that same thing. You need to commit your life to Christ, not half-hearted, like all in. And the last thing he says is, I'm no longer who I once was. Peter's like, yo, I used to doubt that Jesus was enough. Yeah, I may have walked on water, but it only took a couple steps for me to show my true heart. I took my eyes off Jesus and directed on myself and immediately fell, yet Jesus lifted me back up. I used to be a coward. I couldn't even stand up to a little girl when she asked me if I followed Jesus. But now the Holy Spirit has made me bold preaching to 3,000 religious people telling them that they need to repent and stop what they're doing and turn to Jesus. I used to be the clown who said the first thing that came to my mind and just acted without actually thinking of what Jesus told me to do or would want me to do. Now I'm paying attention to what Jesus said and I'm starting, um, and I'm starting to share that wisdom and truth with others. Um, each of, us, each of us needs a story like Peter has. One of humbling and, and confession and repentance and, most importantly, salvation. That's Peter's testimony. It's powerful because it's real and it's true. What Peter's doing here, I, I kind of picture it like they just got the Holy Spirit and he's kind of like just testing out, taking the powers of the Holy Spirit with, for a test drive. And I picture like, I don't know if you've ever seen the first Iron Man movie, it's fantastic. But he first puts on his suit and he didn't even paint it yet. So it's just like all silver and Tony Stark's like, yo, I want to test the limitations of this suit. I don't know what it can do. Let's take it out for a test drive. Let's see what this is capable of. And he takes it out and he's like, yo, let's see how high this can fly. And he starts flying and Jarvis is like yo you're getting too high this is not going to be good and he eventually gets too high and his the atmosphere ices his suit up and uh, he almost falls to his death because of his suit's limitations. Yeah, it was awesome, but it had limitations. But this isn't what happens when Peter does the same thing with the Holy Spirit. What does he realize? He realizes there are no limitations with the Holy Spirit. He's like, I don't know a lot about this Holy Spirit I've been given, but man, let's see what it's capable of even with an imbecile like me. Like, what, the can, what can the Holy Spirit do even with a fool like me? Allow me, one of the least eloquent people in recorded history, to speak the gospel to thousands of people. And if the Holy Spirit can even use me to do this, who can't he use? <laughs> then, then what does the Holy Spirit do? saves the souls, the eternal souls of over 3,000 people from one sermon. There's a lot of things that we can take from this, but I want to point out two things, two things that we have to take from this. Uh, a, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. 
Peter is quite possibly the least qualified person on planet Earth to preach this important sermon as far as our regular human standards go. Let's look at some of his mistakes. Uh, Matthew 15, Peter doesn't understand one of Jesus' parables. Not a huge deal. Matthew 16, Peter misinterprets Jesus. He says something that Jesus didn't say. Mark chapter 10, Peter sends children away to not waste Jesus' time, and Jesus is like, no, bring them back to me. The next generation is important, and you actually need to be more like them. Matthew chapter 14, Peter begins walking on water and then almost drowns after disobeying Jesus. Mark chapter 9, Peter shows his pride by asking if he is the greatest disciple. Um, Matthew chapter 16, Peter tells Jesus not to die on the cross. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, and I quote, Get behind me, Satan. He calls him Satan. Um, John chapter 13, Peter tells Jesus not to wash his feet. And Jesus is like, yo, this is why I came. I don't think you understand. John chapter 18, Peter cuts a dude's ear off. And then Jesus takes the ear, puts it back on. Matthew chapter 26, Peter falls asleep several times when Jesus is asking him as a friend to stay up with him and spend time with him and pray the night before Jesus is going to die. And then later on in that chapter, Peter claims he never even met Jesus three times and even once to a little girl and cusses out a few people who ask him about Jesus. And then John chapter 21, Peter sees all his mistakes, and he feels guilty, and he does something wrong, and he says, I'm going to quit being a disciple and go back to fishing. And then eventually Jesus comes back to him and restores him. Uh, Peter has a lot of flaws and made a lot of mistakes. And these are, these are only the recorded ones. <laughs> he made a lot more. Um, his only qualification, his only qualification to preach the gospel was his closeness with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. He made a lot of mistakes, um, had a lot of character flaws, but 3,000 souls are now in heaven because the Holy Spirit used Peter. The same can and will be true for us. I rejoice in learning about Peter because I see a lot of myself in him, and I hope you do too because we are all like him. No, I don't want you to be flawed. I don't want you to make mistakes, um, but the reality is that we do make mistakes, and we are flawed. And the first step of the gospel impacting your life and in you being a part of spreading it is to see that we all need to have a story like Peter. You don't think Peter knew he was a buffoon? You don't think he was constantly reminded of his mistakes? Do you think that maybe, just maybe, before he got up to preach this important sermon before thousands of people, that someone was like, Yo, remember that time that Jesus literally called you Satan? Maybe you shouldn't be the one doing this. But Peter's response here is so awesome. He's like, yeah, yeah I'm going to preach the gospel. Why? Because Jesus told us to, and he's promised people's eternal souls are going to be saved in every continent, country, city, and town when we do so. Peter was obedient because of that God qualified him. B, the second thing that we got to learn, God has called everybody and loves, loves using nobodies. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that um, it's God's will that none should perish. John 3, 16 and 17 tells us that because of this, he sent Jesus. He doesn't want anybody to eternally perish. And how does he provide that means to be carried out and for people to find out about this Jesus? Through the Holy Spirit using nobodies. Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We read that earlier. Um, let me tell you something really, I think personally, really freaking cool. Um, there was a group of people um, in the book of Acts who were the pioneers and possibly um, some of the most important people of establishing the greatest and most important church maybe of all time in all of Christian history. And we don't know their names. <laughs> Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Uh, Saul is killing people because that's where he was at in life. And there arose a great day of persecution. And um, all the Christians were scattered throughout the regions, except for the apostles. So a bunch of people other than the 11 were scattered all throughout the world. And then um, chapter 11 picks up where that verse left off. Um, now those who were scattered, same people, because of their persecution, these Christians um, arose. And uh, they, they began traveling very far and speaking the word um, to, to um, only specific groups of people. But there were some of them who on coming to Antioch spoke to, spoke to the Hellenists, people who didn't know Jesus, preaching the Lord Jesus. 
And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. That is the beginning of the church at Antioch. They were responsible for starting arguably the most important church of all time. And the Bible doesn't name a single one of them. Why? Because their names don't matter. What matters is that these nobodies said, all right, I'm going to do what God commanded, and the Holy Spirit did something incredible with that. I like to read this part of a, of a book I just went through um, by J.D. Greer, and it's about, it's about that story. And he says, The church at Antioch, which served as a hub for missionary activity for the last half of the book of Acts, was planted by those scattered. Here's what's significant. Luke uses no personal names. He only says that the Lord's hand was, quote, with them. And then he continues, uh, that's Luke's way of saying a bunch of dudes whose name I won't mention because you wouldn't recognize them and won't hear anything about them again anyway. These are the kinds of people who get listed in the credits of the movie as, quote, bystander number three. Throughout Christian history, the gospel has nearly always spread and stuck because ordinary people like you carried the gospel wherever they went. Ordinary people are the tip of the gospel spear. I, I love that. Luke records a bunch of stuff that happens in the lives of people who follow Jesus, and that's, that's why this book is called The Acts of the Apostles, but make no mistake, it's, it's not about them. It's about the Holy Spirit. These are the acts of the Holy Spirit. I'm titling this series The Never-Ending Story of Nobodies. Because this is literal evidence that when it comes to the Holy Spirit moving in and through people's lives, this book is proof that he can and will use all who are filled with his power and are willing. He will use nobodies. He did then, he will today. This is the big thing God is making clear to us tonight. God loves using nobodies qualifications or good resumes be darned god will qualify those who step out in boldness and faith so the last thing i want to end with is our application is to see peter as a model for what we need to do see our own inability and share the gospel anyway the holy spirit did not make peter a better person but rather changed his heart and his heart was changed through the same gospel that he shared so here's what we need to do simply put learn how to share the gospel um, this is not a perfect walkthrough list, but the way that Peter did it, one, come to terms with the fact that you have not always been following Jesus or maybe are not right now and make that decision. Number two, see the need for Jesus that God is making clear to you. Number three, commit your life to following Jesus. And number four, show and tell the world how your life is different now. Romans chapter 10 is a testament of this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Those are two things, confessing and believing. You will be saved. For, for, with, for with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. You, we, we, we have to confess physically that Jesus is Lord, but also believe it in our hearts. The single greatest movement of all time started and was sustained through this message, the gospel. Through the gospel being shared, people crying out to Jesus, being saved, and through the power of the Holy Spirit continuing to move through those people who were saved. All throughout Acts, God just kept adding people to the eternal kingdom of heaven that we get to meet one day. And the only way that you actually get to be a part of this story is by accepting the same gospel and the same salvation. And through being a beacon of the gospel through your words, your actions, and your life. This is just the beginning of one of the greatest stories of all time that has continued to today. And I know it's continued to today because the message of Jesus made it into my life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for um, revealing yourselves in so many ways and for making the gospel apparent and available to everyone. In your son's name, amen.